Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> what we're going to do today and probably on Monday is we'll look at basic statistics. Who's taken a stats class before? Awesome. Right, after all, this is, you know, stats department, so you would expect it, but still, we'll do a few things, uh, fairly basic ones like naive base and we'll sample and so on. Um, <coughs> Okay, who knows what the central limit theorem is? Okay, who's tested it in practice? Okay, we'll do that today or on Tuesday. <laughs> it's a couple of lines of Python. That's actually the nice thing about it. So I guess that's the obvi obvious trite joke, but okay, fine, so we can go fairly quickly over this, you know, space of events and you know, you might have server working or whatever. You have the usual cosmograph axioms, I guess everybody knows them, so you know, the pr probability of some you know, event is like somewhere between zero and one, can't be larger than one and can be n cannot be negative. And the probability that something happens is one, okay, duh. And if the various events are disjoint, then you know, the sum of the corresponding probabilities is the sum of the, is the probability of the you know, union of the events. And then, you know, the obvious thing that I can have discrete and continuous things, so the probability of a server not working, of a server working might be, you know, 99.9%. .9%. But asking me, you know, what's the probability of my income being $91,000.05, well, that probability is essentially negligible. But a question asking whether my salary is between $90,000 and $100,000, uh, well, that's now a more reasonable question, and let's say, for instance, the probability might be 10%. Well, don't worry, Amazon pays better than that, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is for you know illustration purposes. Um, here's the ob mandatory Venn diagram. If I have you know two events, <coughs> probability for both things happening, you know, that's not the intersection of this. Okay, it's all straightforward. And so therefore, you know, the probability of the union is the probability of one and the probability of the other minus the probability in the intersection. So this is all fairly nice sets and measures and so on. And you could take an entire measure theory class and do this for real. Um, but this is a deep learning course, so, this, so we don't need to go into a lot of detail here. A couple of useful things, independence. So for instance, the login behavior of two users is approximately independent. This crash in different colos is approximately independent. Might not entirely be independent, uh, depending on you know what, let's say you get a bad batch of disks and then they all fail at the same time. But then conditioned on this being a, ba a bad batch, they would be independent again. So, but if we have something that's independent, we can just write P of X and Y is P of X times P of Y. It's nice, but it's also very boring. Dependent events, <coughs> emails. Hopefully, my reply to your question on, you know, on discuss or you know, on the Google Groups. And by the way, that email is working now. Uh, there was a slightly uh, cautious, uh, basically Google Group setting before that made all the emails bounce. So that's fixed. But hopefully my reply to your question should not be independent of your question, at least if I do a decent job. Um, search queries on the web might be uh, dependent, like, well, how to create an AWS account, how to launch a deep learning army, uh, how to install NVIDIA drivers, how to open Jupyter, you might, you know, Google search all of that. I hope that you won't have to because I explained some things before, but yeah new streams, IM communication, obviously also Russian roulette, right? If you fire and you survive, <laughs> the next event is not independent of the first one. Okay, suppose somebody forces me to play Russian roulette twice. What do I need to do before I pull the trigger the second time, assuming I survived the first one, to increase my chances of survival? Any suggestions? Okay. Okay, so you spin the revolver. And so, w why is this a good idea? Because it reduces, because you have a one five chance of effectively 
Yes. The first time, and then bid it, you have a one in six chance the second. <laughs> exactly. So the first time you have a one in six chance because the first time you, fought, you know, you pull the trigger. I mean, the, you know, the revolver is in arbitrary position. But now, yeah, there are only you know five left, and <coughs> well, you know, at the latest, after you know six times pulling the trigger, you're dead no matter what. <laughs> Whereas if you spin the trigger again, then again it's one out of six. This is an example where making things independent changes things. There's a nice other problem called the Monty Hall problem. At some point, Google searched that. So it's, it's very nicely explained about conditional probabilities and so on. Um, and you can wonderfully stump anybody who doesn't know statistics. In any case, what this means is that P of X and Y is not P of X times P of Y. And that's pretty much everywhere. And that's actually awesome because that makes our life easy. Yes? What's Pardon? What's oh, this is just <coughs> different locations for where servers are. They are called colos sometimes. Uh, for instance, it comes from co locating various servers. So, for instance, uh, tele you know, telephone companies might have a big switchboard and they have lots of wires, and then they tell you, hey, you can put your servers into our location, and then they tell another company the same thing. So, multiple servers are co located, hence a colo. Yeah, sorry. This is, you know, jargon from servers. Sorry. Um, <coughs> now, let's do something very simple, right? Everybody knows what a cat and a dog looks like. Okay. Okay, so which one's the cat, which one's the dog? Top one's the cat? Okay, you saw the slides, right? Okay, so, well, right now it's just like, okay, it's, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess, right? Okay. Yeah, it took me a while to find a white dog that looks very cat-like. <laughs> and this cat looks very unnatural, but in any case, uh, yeah. Um, so, well, what happened here, right? Well, what happened is that there are really two different ways of, you know, you know what, uh, what can happen. So, right, I could just be very uncertain about things like the coin flip or a lottery. Or it could be that due to conditioning, well, I can actually tighten down those probabilities. Right? So I just had more context, and that more side information helped me narrow down the probability to a point where, you know, hey, anybody can say, hey, this is a cat, this is a dog, right? Now, why do we care? Well, because we're going to use that to build, you know, classifiers, regressors, you know, other estimators, and that's the entire point of this course, right? Um, in information theory, this is called the information never hurts principle. So it's a nice result about conditional entropies and so on. So if you take an information theory course, this is going to be one of the first things they'll probably cover. Um, but we're not going to go into detail here, but <coughs> this really helps. Now, base rule. I guess everybody knows it. Um, so let's do a quick refresher. And the way how you would derive it is, of course, P of X and Y is P of X given Y times P of Y. And by symmetry, it also has to be P of Y given X times P of X, right? Okay, so then you just solve for P of X given Y. And lo and behold, you get that this is P of Y given X times P of X divided by P of Y. Okay, sounds pretty boring, right? Um, I can use that for hypothesis testing or reverse conditioning. And let's actually use this. Hey, so let's take, let's look at an AIDS test, right? Um, so let's assume that about maybe 0.1% of the population are infected. Well, the numbers in, in the United States are lower, but let's just assume that because the math looks a bit nicer. And whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers would be a lot higher. And let's assume I have a test that really detects all the infections, but it has a false positive rate where for 1% of all healthy po people it detects, it, it says that they have AIDS. So what are the chances that somebody actually has AIDS if the test comes back positive? Okay, why don't you try working that out on a piece of paper in a minute? 
it's fairly straightforward. So fun side story, medical professionals aren't very good at this. Um, so at the university where I used to be once, um, so the doctor there would recommend people not to take an AIDS test because, well, they say, he said, well, you know, if it comes back positive, you'll have a horrible week. <laughs> um, so, okay. Who's got the answer? Okay. Okay. Let's look at it. So the probability of AIDS, given that the outcome of the test is, you know, the probability of the test outcome, given whether that person has AIDS, times the prior probability that they have AIDS, divided by the probability that that specific test outcome happens, right? It's standard base rule. So we know the numerator is we know that P of T <coughs> equals 1, given that A is equals 1, that's 1. <coughs> and we know the prior probability of AIDS, that's 0 0.001. Okay. We don't know the denomina denominator, so now we need to expand this into all the cases where the person had AIDS and the test came back positive, and all the cases where the person didn't have AIDS and the test came back positive. <coughs> so the first term is again 0 0.001. It's basically that's all people who are infected. And then the 99.9%, .9 for them I get the 1% chance that the test comes back positive. So the chances that the person actually has AIDS is about 9%. Okay. This is supremely counterintuitive. So suppose this happens. Well, what's the doctor going to do next? He's going to order another test, right? So let's do that. So test two isn't quite so good, right? It reports positive for 90% of infections, 5% for healthy people. And if you work the numbers again, and you get that now it's the chance that you're actually infected is around 36%. So even after two tests, things still look pretty decent. Okay. Question. Why can't I use test one twice? After all, test one is a really good test, right? Detects all diseases, has a very low false positive rate relative to this one. So why can't I use test one twice? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're spot on. So the running test one twice will just give me the same answer as many times as I want, right? And that's not what I want, right? Because I want to make sure that I get a second independent result. Well, actually, I don't really care about independence. I care about conditional independence. I, ne I care about a conditional on whether that person has a disease or not, the outcomes are independent. Because if the test two was completely independent of everything else, then well, it'll be just some random number, right? So this is conditional independence. This is about as deep as we'll ever de delve into statistic probability here in this course. But just as a heads up, there are some 
minor details that can force you to design your, you know, your estimators reasonably well and uh, your objective functions and so on. So basically, be careful what you're doing. Okay, and before we use this, let's 